So uh, welcome um, to uh, the Endometriosis UK web webinar on the ESHRI guidelines. Those initials will be spelled out to you shortly. Um, and I'm delighted that today we've got two fantastic speakers. Um, we're joined by Dr. Christian Becker. I think it's Professor actually Becker, is it not? Um, it should be, Dr. and Professor. Um, so uh, Christian is the clinical lead and co-director at the BSGE Centre in Oxford. Um, he's also chaired the guideline development group for these ESHRAE guidelines. So he's absolutely the right person to be talking to us uh, this evening. Um, and also we have Helen McLaughlin. Helen uh, was a member of the ESHRAE guidelines review group, um, which helped develop the guidelines. And Helen is also, uh, one of our support group leaders in London and has volunteered on a whole range of things as well. So um, what we're going to be doing today is Christian's going to talk to us about the guidelines um, and then um, Helen will, uh, will talk about her role in them as well and why it is and then we can ask, answer um, Q and uh, some questions on that. Just to flag why I get quite excited about the SRA guidelines because they are quite a dry document, some might think. I think it's nearly 200 pages, although there is a summary. Um, one of the, the things that's really important for a charity like Endometriosis UK is if we want to achieve change, we need to have evidence that change is needed. So if you want to improve care, we need to say this is best practice, etc. And because new European level guidelines are out, that gives us real leverage to say in the UK, look, you know, there's some gaps in what we do now. So for me, these are like really important, uh, not just because they set out best practice, but they also give a tool for Endometriosis UK to campaign with as well. I know that's not the main point, but it's really helpful for us as a charity. But anyway, I would like to pass over to Christian, if I may, who is going to talk to us about uh, the new guidelines. Uh, thank you, um, Emma. <clears throat> uh, thanks everybody for joining tonight. Um, I know there are other things that people can do, but I'm, I'm glad that uh, you're, you're joining today. Let me just share my um, other uh, monitor here. And um, I'm looking to the side, so I apologize. It's just um, impossible. Otherwise, my other monitor is too small. So, um, Endometriosis UK asked me to speak about the new European guidelines on endometriosis, which were developed under the umbrella of ESHRE, uh, or E-S-H-R-E, ESHRE. Uh, that's the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology. Why that is, um, I'll explain in a minute. Uh, so let's see how we can move this onwards. Uh, these are my conflict of interest, if anyone is interested. Um, so uh, um, I have received uh, fees for consultancy and also in Oxford, we um, have um, grants with, um, with companies. Um, none of the money that um, came went to me, so it all went into research, um, just to let you know. So uh, the ESHRA guidelines um, base on, uh, or the current guidelines base actually on the original guidelines, which were from 2005, not 2014, which you're seeing here at the moment. Uh, so back then, um, um, probably 10 or 12 uh, experts uh, in the field met um, and supported by, by ESHRA, um, probably because ESHRA, as the um, Society for Reproduction and Embryology um, uh, is interested in endometriosis because, as we know, about 30 to 50 percent of women with endometriosis may have problems uh, conceiving. Um, so back then, uh, with relatively um, uh, straightforward uh, methods, they um, came up with um, you know guidelines according to the evidence that was available at the time. Um, and that was the very first guideline for ESHRA. Now they've had, they have tons of them for recurrent miscarriages and um, fertility preservation and, and all these type of things. Um, in 2014, then there was an update. Um, and I was involved in that uh, group already at that time, um, just uh, looking at uh, new evidence that's out there. And then um, every a few years, uh, this has to be updated. And therefore, the new guideline um, was just published in 2022, uh, so about a month ago. Um, it's freely available to anyone. Uh, as you, I'll show you later, there's also a patient-friendly version, so really understandable um, um, in English. Uh, also, we're translating it into Dutch. Um, so uh, these guidelines are now um, um, generated according to the best available evidence and also uh, with quite strict methodological um, rules as we have to have them now, similar to the NICE guidelines, um, really. 
So uh, the methodology is according to uh, this manual. So it's like a guideline to guidelines. Um, so basically what happens is first, obviously you have to select the uh, topic, which is endometriosis. And then you form the, um, the uh, guideline development group, uh, the scoping is done, and then uh, the key questions are asked, which I'll tell you uh, about in a minute. According to those questions, uh, then the evidence is ser searched. There are large databases online that um, information specialists can look for. Um, and then the evidence is synthesized by the um, uh, development group. Um, and they then formulate, uh, uh, formulate recommendations uh, that's then written down in a, in a, a preliminary document. Uh, and that again was then um, uh, made available to stakeholders, which in this case were all the ESHRA members, and there's a, you know, many thousands of them. Um, they were able to give comments uh, within, uh, I think, six to eight weeks. These were then taken into account into the final document, which was then approved by the executive committee of ESHRA and then um, published uh, very recently, as I said, on the, uh, on the website. There's also a, um, a scientific paper coming out um, very soon. So for these questions that we asked, and again, this were not um, only doctors who came up with these questions, we did this together with um, patient representatives. Um, the literature search was done and the deadline for you know, the evidence was uh, 1st of December 2020. That's how long it takes to get all this together then afterwards. Um, we, only, we did not only look at the, the written evidence what, that's out there, but also when we made the recommendations, we took into account other factors such as uh, you know, benefits versus harms for patients and also patient values. Um, costs, as you can see, were also considered uh, not as much as for NICE guidelines, and that's probably because uh, it's an international guideline um, and therefore different health systems um, play a role, obviously. Um, and then for the recommendations, we came up with um, either a strong or weak recommendation, depending on the, um, the strength of the, um, the evidence as well. Um, if there was no evidence there, but um, as the guideline development group, we thought, um, it's important to mention this, um, we came up with a good practice point. So based on our experience, and uh, a lot of us have many, many years of experience with um, endometriosis. Um, but we also saw that there were lots of holes in our knowledge, uh, and therefore we um, generated also um, research recommendations. I think 30 altogether, um, we probably could have come up with many more, um, but um, we decided to um, you know, focus on, on uh, some of them. So this is actually the, the core development um, guideline development group. Uh, these were the, uh, the leads for the uh, um, subchapters. So um, as you can see me, uh, I was doing um, the diagnosis bit. Um, other colleagues uh, were doing medical treatment, surgical treatment, infertility, medically assisted reproduction, which is basically IVF and IUI. Uh, the non-medical subgroup. So this is um, you know, treatment that is not the classical um, medication that we're using at the moment. Uh, we had a, a chapter uh, specific, specifically for adolescents and uh, also for menopause um, um, endometriosis. There was another uh, chapter on prevention, uh, one on extra pelvic um, and asymptomatic endometriosis, and also then uh, specifically uh, a chapter for cancer as well. So again, these are uh, the people, just to show you where we all came from, uh, UK is quite heavy. Um, so um, you may um, recognize uh, some of the, the names on here, but also to show you that this was not a pure, you know, um, doctor um, focused thing. We had two uh, very vocal, uh, very good patient representatives in these uh, core groups. Now the core groups um, were uh, there to make it possible to really come up come up with a final document. Each subchapter had uh, their own um, group of experts that were um, looking at the evidence and formulated actually the recommendations and wrote their chapter, um, which is, was then presented to the core group um, of the people you see here. Um, we just thought that um, it's much more inclusive, you get more um, uh, support from, from experts in the field uh, specifically uh, for their chapter. And um, uh, it's not, you know, the, the ESHRA guideline group is not seen as a little club of people who love to meet each, uh, each um, five years or so. 
Um, and um, I think it worked actually quite well. So the questions that we asked were um, 42 questions um, and those were so-called PICO questions. So PICO um, is an abbreviation for questions that uh, focus on patients, interventions, comparison and outcome. So these things need to be addressed in that question. Um, there were also some questions that couldn't meet those criteria and those were then narrative questions. So 35 and seven. And overall, we came up with 109 recommendations or good clinical practice points, as I said, where there was no good evidence available and also 30 research recommendations. So for those who um, haven't attended um, uh, the, um, the meeting we had um, about a week ago um, organized by NMHS UK, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the changes um, um, that are different from the previous guideline. So that the main change that um, was probably picked up mostly in social media was um, the, the comment that um, laparoscopy is not uh, no longer seen as the diagnostic gold standard um, for uh, endometriosis. And that, you know, that gold standard quote uh, originated from the original guideline in 2005. So we've seen that um, there's increasing evidence that good ultrasound scan and good MRI are probably uh, good enough to identify or rule out um, ovarian endometriosis, meaning ovarian cysts, but also um, um, deep endometriosis. But uh, the problem is still with superficial um, peritoneal endometriosis, and that's where we're still struggling. But uh, we try to get away from this blanket um, recommendation that um, laparoscopy is the gold standard for everything, it's probably a more for um, a more for peritoneal disease rather than uh, endometriosis per se. Um, other changes uh, that are a bit more specific. So, um, new uh, one of the new drugs that is, uh, is coming, a group of drugs that's coming on the market now are so-called GnRH antagonists. You may have heard of agonists, and the drugs are usually called Zolodex or Prostab or Lupron. Um, uh, these antagonists are slightly different similar approach, I guess, but um, the one benefit is they can be taken orally, so as tablets rather than um, these injections monthly or three monthly, but they do also have similar side effect profiles um, as, um, as the uh, injections as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, then there is um, some data now to suggest that if uh, patients have um, uh, surgery, that um, maybe medical treatment should be um, commenced at that time if, had, if they haven't had uh, treatment before to improve um, the outcome of, of surgery. Before, there wasn't any evidence to support this, so this has changed since 2014. Um, if you look at fertility, um, again, this is very specific. So those women, uh, those of you who may have gone through IVF or are thinking about this uh, in the old days uh, and until recently, um, we used to say that if uh, women have stage three or four endometriosis, um, they may benefit um, purely from an IVF uh, success perspective if their ovaries were uh, um, uh, suppressed with these GnRH agonists, with these monthly injections for three to six months. Um, however, newer data have actually shown that uh, that's probably not the case, which shows you that um, you know, nothing's written into stone and um, depending on what studies are coming out, um, things sometimes change. Um, one thing that is, I think, important for everybody, so if you're having a laparoscopy for um, endometriosis and you are trying to, or you have been trying to conceive, um, um, there is something uh, out there now called the endometriosis fertility index. So you should probably ask your, job, your doctor to tell you, um, uh, or ask him or her whether she's able to tell you the endometriosis fertility index after the operation. Um, that's a, a composite, composite index that takes into account various things. So what do the fallopian tubes and the ovaries look like at the end of surgery? Um, um, what is the stage of endometriosis? How old is the patient? How long has she been trying to conceive? Has she had children already? So all these things um, are taken into account. And then um, in the end, there is a, um, a point score that comes out of this. And um, according to this, uh, the doctor can tell you, you have a 20, 30, 60% chance of conceiving within the next six or 12 or, or even more months. Um, and that has been validated by independent groups um, and seems to be quite reliable nowadays. So um, maybe keep that in mind. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, other things that um, are new are that we have specific chapters now on adolescent endometriosis and menopause endometriosis because we really wanted to highlight this. The last time it was a bit um, uh, under uh, the other chapters, but just to show, um, you know, it's very important uh, that, you know, people are aware um, endometriosis does occur in adolescents. You know, this typical quote by, by doctors, oh, you cannot have endometriosis because you're too young for it. Um, I think that should be something uh, of the past. Uh, also, we have a specific chapter on, on cancer, uh, which I'll show you some data on as well in a second. So instead of going through all these 109 recommendations, which would be very boring, um, there are a few um, uh, summaries and some recommendations I'll, I'll, I'll go into. So this is for diagnosis, and we try to summarize a little bit what is out there. So if women have signs and symptoms of, um, you know, as, as described here, so dysmenorrhea means um, painful periods. Um, dyspare, deep dyspareunia means pain or deep pain during sexual intercourse. Dysuria means um, pain emptying bladder. And dyskesia um, is a very specific word. It means um, we have pain emptying your, your, your bowel. Um, uh, rectal bleeding and hematuria. So hematuria is blood from the bladder. These things should um, um, provoke thoughts in the doctor to say, actually, maybe endometriosis is um, uh, behind all this. It doesn't have to be very clearly, but it's something that should be a, an option. Same thing on the right-hand side, so shoulder tip pain or a pneumothorax, which means that um, the, 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 bag where the, lung, the bags where the lungs are in, uh, they can rupture sometimes if there's endometriosis in that area. It's very, very rare. In tertiary centers like Oxford or others, you know, we see this more often, but um, again, this is something that sometimes happens and you know, people don't necessarily think about endometriosis as an option. Fatigue is quite common and infertility as well. Yeah, so um, the recommendation is to really explore um, the possibility of endometriosis. So coming back to um, this thing about, you know, the gold standard in laparoscopy. So um, one of the questions was, does diagnostic laparoscopy uh, compared with empirical medical treatment? So empirical medical treatment is if we suspect endometriosis according to the symptoms that a patient have, uh, has, and uh, we then treat her as if this was potentially endometriosis, usually with um, the different hormones, um, does that result in better symptoms? So is there any benefit either way? And, um, you know, there is not. So at the moment, we don't have any evidence to say um, diagnostic laparoscopy is better than empirical medical treatment. You, um, you have to balance, the patient and doctors have to balance the pros and cons of this. So, you know, if you do surgery, yes, you uh, will see endometriosis if it's there and you, if you have a person who actually looks for it properly but you expose the patient to a surgery and people have had many, many surgeries um, and surgeons tend to always think they're the best, best surgeon anyway. And, you know, we, we then do an operation if uh, the other person hasn't found anything. So we've got to be careful with that. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, medical treatment has its side effects as well, um, but you avoid surgery. So there are, you know, these things that you have to discuss with a patient. And I think the most important point is that it's a, it's a, um, decision that the patient makes with, with a doctor um, and the patient needs to be informed about the pros and cons of, of um, all the approaches. Uh, another thing that is on this uh, slide here is um, uh, we support um, psychological su um, support for patients with um, endometriosis because we all know it can have a significant impact on, on the lives of, of many women. Um, the um, recommendation, however, is weak, and that is not because we think it's not so important, it's just it's, uh, because there's no good evidence yet. So again, those are things that need to be researched much better. For example, we don't know for how long you should give it, uh, you should be followed up um, and how frequently. So when it comes to diagnosis, um, ideally patients, um, as you can see here in the middle in this um, um, chart, uh, sh should be examined ideally and have some form of imaging, and that should be ultrasound or MRI. Um, and there are different reasons for one over the other. Um, if patients have signs of endometriosis, then, um, oops, sorry, then they should um, either have um, uh, treatment uh, for this, and this can be empirical treatment, or uh, it could be um, surgical treatment. So especially if empirical treatment, meaning with hormones, 
is unsuccessful or un inappropriate, or for example, if the patient really says, uh, doc, I need to know whether this is endometriosis or not, um, then I think as long as she understands the pros and cons, uh, then a diagnostic laparoscopy is definitely an option. Yeah. Um, and we always would say diagnostic laparoscopy by itself is probably not the best thing. Ideally, you should do surgery um, as in, you know, treat the endometriosis at the same time. There may be situations where it's quite, um, you know, extensive endometriosis where it may be better to um, stop the operation and uh, do it then in a, um, maybe in a, in a tertiary center um, where people do this uh, type of more advanced surgery all the time. So finally, for the diagnosis, um, um, one thing that we also thought, um, you know, obviously everybody should be diagnosed early because, um, you know, people are suffering for a long time. Um, but again, there is no data to support this. This is um, based on what we all believe is best, but unfortunately there are no studies yet to really support this. So this was um, just us saying, you know, we really think, you know, even, even though we don't have the evidence, uh, we need to do something about it and uh, therefore early evidence um, you know, people should be diagnosed early. When it comes to pain, and again, this is a big field, so um, it's very shortly summarized here. If patients are coming because of pain primarily, and I usually ask my patient, you know, what's the main reason why you're here? Is it, if you had to decide, which is almost impossible, is it pain or infertility? Um, if they say pain is the main thing, then, you know, you know, it's a kind of three column approach, um, unfortunately still only. Um, these are pain relief, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac uh, sometimes as well, other analgesics, um, um, probably often together with other approaches. So hormone treatment, and we know uh, the usual suspects, uh, the different pills, um, progestogens, um, uh, vaginal um, contraceptive devices, uh, subcutaneous ones, injections, they're all different options out there, but also surgery is an option. So these are the things um, that need to be discussed. And as it says on the bottom, individual preferences, side effects, efficacy, costs uh, to a certain extent, and av availability has to be taken into consideration. Um, and one reason why I just wanted to highlight this, not because this is any better or not, uh, just to again, uh, let you know about the GnRH antagonist on the bottom here. Uh, so they are coming on the market in the US, uh, they're available already, quite expensive. So uh, we'll see whether they will be available in this country um, and in other uh, countries in Europe as well. I think there's a bit of discussion about this. They, similar to the monthly injections, um, probably need some form of um, HRT add back uh, treatment to avoid the uh, or treat the menopausal symptoms that you would otherwise get. Women who are primarily suffering from infertility uh, or fertility issues, um, they cannot have hormonal treatment. So it's clear that all the hormones that we're given are um, in some form uh, contraceptive and they just prolong the time for women uh, not being able to conceive. So those women should either give it a try and see what's happening. So obviously then they wouldn't be infertile, but if a patient comes to the door and says, uh, doc, uh, doctor, I'm, I'm, I have endometriosis, um, I'm not gonna get pregnant, am I? And then I usually say, well, give it a try because often it still happens. So I said about 30 to 50% of women have problems conceiving, um, but if they already have tried and it's unsuccessful, um, then you know surgery is an option or uh, fertility treatment, which may be intrauterine insemination or probably in most cases IVF uh, nowadays. If surgery um, is performed, um, as I said, you know, the endometriosis fertility index should be used to identify whether um, people have a reasonable chance to conceive naturally or whether they should go through IVF um, afterwards. Um, something that we can discuss a bit more in detail, fertility pre preservation um, is quite uh, interesting at the moment. Very little evidence available still at the moment. Um, so, um, you know, some people obviously are suffering from endometriosis, especially uh, of the ovaries. We know that ovarian um, uh, endometriosis cysts can reduce um, the ovarian reserve. So women are born with their eggs, many, many, many thousands um, of eggs, and everybody goes through those in their in her reproductive life cycle. 
um, endometrioma, um, so endometriosis cyst, uh, do reduce those, probably some toxic effect locally. On the other hand, if we treat them surgically, uh, we're probably not any better and maybe even worse um, because no matter how good or bad, or bad of a surgeon you are, we know that ovarian reserve is reduced after surgery for um, ovarian endometriosis. So something to consider, but um, I would usually t suggest to my patients that um, we should assess ovarian reserve and there are tests that we can do and we can talk about this later if you guys want to. Um, once someone is pregnant, um, one thing to consider is that um, endometriosis is associated with a slightly increased risk of um, first trimester miscarriage and ectopic pregnancy. Probably the ectopic pregnancy because the fallopian tubes can be affected and um, um, the embryo may, uh, may uh, be stuck there. Also, when you're pregnant, everything's um, normal intrauterine pregnancy. There's a slight increase of uh, increased risk of some obstetric complications. Um, uh, Preeclampsia, for example, is, is one of them. So something to keep in mind, but not enough to say uh, you are high risk um, 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 pregnancy uh, because of your endometriosis, uh, but just uh, something to keep in the back of, uh, of the head. Um, as I said, there is um, a chapter on primary prevention. Again, there's going to be more, there will be more um, recommendations that you can find. Um, I sometimes see patients um, where mom comes with her daughter, mom has had um, significant endometriosis and ask what can I do about my daughter so she doesn't run into the same uh, issues and she doesn't have to suffer the same problems that I've had. Um, and then I say, don't know. Um, obviously the easy approach is to say, well, maybe if she's old enough and it fits with religion and, and all, uh, other things as well, maybe put her on the pill. But any drug has an effect and a side effect. And if you go purely go by the evidence, we don't know. Um, so that's a problem. Um, if we say, well, we suppress endometriosis in those women who have endometriosis uh, with, um, uh, um, with, with a pill, then you could say, or you could, you could extrapolate then, well, maybe we can prevent it as well, but we, we just don't know. So um, keep that in mind that also pills can have side effects um, as well. Uh, as we know, but also, um, especially in someone who doesn't have any symptoms, um, to keep that in mind. Um, menopause, um, one thing that is, I think, very important to highlight is that um, endometriosis can occur or continue into menopause. Um, so yes, a lot of people, um, a lot of women are much better when uh, menopause hits, purely from an endometriosis perspective, obviously there are other problems that come with menopause, um, just because the hormone levels drop. However, during menopause, and especially during induced menopause, as in us, the, gyne the, the gynecologist inducing it by giving the Zolodex injections or Prostap injections, or if we take both ovaries out for whatever reason, um, women often need um, um, HRT, so hormone replacement therapy, or as it's nowadays called officially menopause hormone therapy for whatever reason. Um, so um, those women who are in, meno in early menopause, because we've induced that, that uh, the clear recommendation is they need HRT. And uh, I don't know if it's on this slide or um, another one that I um, may have still here. Yeah, um, the, um, we, we should probably um, avoid giving estrogen only um, HRT uh, because Endometriosis, if we believe endometriosis tissue is similar to uterine lining tissue, um, you need some form of progesterone as well to pre protect the uterine lining. Even if the uterus is out, uh, there is probably some benefit in being on combined HRT, even though, again, evidence is very poor. It's purely from uh, some case reports and case studies. And, and so that's the, the worst evidence that you can have because um, it's very biased, um, obviously. And then finally, um, cancer. Um, so I think it's very important to know that endometriosis is not a precancerous condition. Um, so if you have endometriosis, don't fear for your life uh, from a cancer perspective. However, there are, um, um, there are certain cancers that are more common in patients with endometriosis. One of them is ovarian cancer, one of them is breast cancer, and one of them is thyroid cancer. And that's coming from, um, from epidemiological studies. Um, here is 
just to give you a better idea of you know how to look at this so you know each of these um you know depicted women um represent one in a hundred so on the on the upper panels um these are women in general uh, and the risk of developing ovarian cancer is 1.3 in a hundred or 13 in a thousand for breast cancer it's higher it's 12.8 in a hundred for thyroid cancer it's again it's 1.3 now if you have endometriosis that risk rate uh, rises to 2.5 in 100 for ovarian cancer, 13.3 in 100 for breast cancer, and 1.8 um, in 100 for thyroid cancer. So statistically significant difference, yes. Clinically, I would argue not very much. Um, so, um, so not that you need to be significantly worried about this. That's how we see it from a doctor perspective. Maybe patients think about this different, but the patient representatives that were involved in the guidelines um uh they thought also that um we should give this guidance that you know don't worry um about cancer really with endometriosis um therefore also we should not do any particular cancer screening just because quote unquote just because of endometriosis um um you have to look at um certain risk factors and if there are particular risk factors um uh, then, um, you know, maybe that, that is uh, one of the reasons. Um, much bigger risks for cancer is um, if you have an unhealthy lifestyle, there are much bigger risk factors than endometriosis, so keep that in mind as well. There's one um, uh, recommendation here that says, if you have endometriosis, ideally you should remove it as much as possible, because there are some data to suggest that that may reduce that increased risk um, of, of developing certain cancers. Um, it's moderate um, evidence, I'm, I would say. So I'm done now. So um, as I said, these are the ESHRA guidelines available on the ESHRA uh, website. So if you want to look it up, uh, just Google ESHRA um, guideline endometriosis. You will find on the left-hand side, this is the very thick document. Um, um, I don't think it's, you know, many oh, 200 pages or so, if I remember correctly. Um, and focused on, on, um, on healthcare professionals. On the right-hand side, this is the uh, patient version. Uh, we try to make it really understandable. I hope um, it'd, be, it'd be great to get some feedback on this. Um, it's also, there's also a Dutch version. And if anyone would like to volunteer to translate it in a different version, I'm sure we'd be very happy to uh, assist you with that. And I think I'm very happy to take any questions after obviously Helen has uh, spoken to you. Christian, thank you so much. That was really informative. We'll go straight on to Helen and then we'll take questions uh, after Helen's spoken. And we've already got a few coming through. Thank you. As I say, um, said earlier, it's on the Q&A section. Helen, over to you. Thank you. Um, doing, thank you, Christian, as well. I'm doing my best Bohemian Rhapsody impression right now with the lighting. So uh, let's let's go. Um, so just to give my endo, endo patient credentials, if you like, because um, being a patient rep, you need to people to have confidence that you are indeed able to represent um, and having had lived experience. So that's for both patients and medical professionals. Um, so I was diagnosed in 2011 after being put on the pill in 2001. Um, my endo was controlled until 2010 when it was finally diagnosed when the symptoms broke through. Um, so since then I've had one diagnostic surgery and four other surgeries. I've had solidex, painkillers, et cetera, and Myrena coil. And right now I had excision surgery in 2018 and that along with pelvic floor physio and some six months of nortriptyline, um, that means that I'm pain free most of the time. So the main reason why I do anything with endo is for my goddaughter. She's now 10. Um, she was three when I started to volunteer. Um, but instantly her grandma, who was, is also my auntie, um, she was diagnosed with endo over 43 years ago. So, um, yeah, I know that there's family links, etc. cetera. Um, but out of all the volunteer work I do, nothing beats a good general support group. And in those general support groups, I try and take on board as much as I can from all different backgrounds and representations. And I bring that with me to the table whenever I do anything such as this. Um, so why the ESHRI guidelines? To be honest, I didn't, I hadn't heard of ESHRI um, before um, until our fairy, our endo fairy godmother, Carol Pearson, she messaged me to let me know about them 
Um, and I applied because I believe the constant change and review of everything in life is important. I had, after I applied and heard about them, I actually read through the 2014 guidelines. I was a bit disheartened, to be honest, because there was a lot of recommendations um, and the end wording was, you know, more research required. And it's like, yes, we know, we know this. Um, but I've always loved science. Um, when I was little, I wanted to be a vet. And I love attending the endo conferences and research seminars and learning as much as possible. And as an accountant, I really enjoy processes. So I decided to buy a ticket to win the raffle and uh, I applied and thankfully was accepted. So Christian's already been through um, the process, but as a patient and non-medical person, and this is just if anyone is thinking of getting involved with research or any guidelines in the future, um, it's totally fine. It was complete unknown. Um, so as Christian's explained, there was the core group and then there was working groups that spouted off of that. Um, and I say other medical persons because it wasn't just um, surgeons, there was also researchers and physios, etc. And it was also great to work with other people from around Europe and also, you know, just, just get your head out of the NHS system and see what other people do and, and how we could improve or, or where we are leading. Um, a nice point was that my consultant was also in the surgery group. So it gave the added bonus of being able to give both sides of the story. And um, so as Christian explained, we went through the PICO questions and um, to question them and give feedback and also make any recommendations to add or remove or amend. And then the literature searches commenced, which is called a Cochrane review, which I never knew about this. Um, and these results were fed back by, a, these literature searches were fed back by a huge color coded Excel sheet. And the accountant in me was very impressed with these uh, documents. And then the group split to decipher and write draft responses. And then these responses were circulated. And then this is where I came back into it with the whole reading these huge documents. So all of the group members annotated and read through and suggested alternative wordings, asked questions. Um, I asked for clarity and gave feedback and always try to keep in mind what is useful for us as patients to know and what concerns we have. And then the final draft version was circulated with more feedback, etc. So I feel that patient involvement is so very important to everything because the existing wording um, for one part regarding hysterectomy um, was once a woman has completed her family, which obviously um, we as patients know there are many factors behind this. So the uh, unable to conceive, the opportunity didn't arise in terms of maintaining a relationship. Uh, some people don't want children, um, but they do want a hysterectomy. Um, and in support group, I know that women are being told that they can't have surgery until they are ready to have babies. So obviously you can't complete your family if you don't want babies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I raised this and suggested alternative word and, and I, I suggested the phrase once finality of reproduction has been discussed and this wording was changed and I think that was a real impact on in terms of changing where the, the clinical focus is based, it's based on the person and not, not the breeding if you like. Um, so how was it? So it, it's fascinating reading the literature and I loved it and I loved hearing the clinical debates um, sometimes I sit there and I do not have a clue what's going on. Um, but then I think about it, process it, and it was just really, really interesting. Um, as Christian, I keep saying this, as Christian mentioned, um, but what they consider to be how success is measured. For us, success might be um, being able to work full time. For them, success is you don't go back within three years. It's kind of different, different measures for different people. Um, but I was really, really worried about making a fool of myself to start with, to be honest. Um, but every time I asked a question or raised a point, it was answered and explained or very much taken into account. And I was never made to feel inferior. And everyone was always really lovely and open. And since um, since that, the guidelines have kind of finished our work and um, keeping in touch with people, especially via Twitter and email. And it was just a lovely working relationship. If you are thinking about getting involved with research and guidelines, um, sometimes it's very close to home, particularly with the cancer guidelines. Um, you know, we've all got our concerns about what's going to be uncovered. Um, so sometimes it was difficult to keep emotions separate, but it's also OK to let a little bit of emotion out and communicate how important to us the area is. And then it's also having the patient involvement. Is it true and is it useful? And does it address issues that we need addressing? 
there are previous research projects out there that have been a disappointment it's not relevant to what we need and it's also you know we, we've got limited research funding so it needs to be spent wisely so the other people might have concerns about um make you know the time that's needed to take part in such a thing um it's just key time management and i were, i was on a flight to ireland and i printed off these draft papers to review and the chap next to me i was reading the bit about bowel bowels and endo and um the chap was reading over my shoulder so uh, he has a very interesting flight where he learned all about endo as much as he could stomach um, but yeah, essentially, I just really enjoyed it and I would recommend it to anyone. And I fully appreciate the work of Eshra now. I, as I said, I didn't really know what they were about, but now it's an incredible organisation. And not only are these European guidelines, but it's been a truly go global reaction. And that's one of the things I didn't fully appreciate before I went into this. But yeah, it's been it's been great. So thank you. Thank you, Helen. That's um, great. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, we are constantly looking for people who want to be involved in um, research projects as, uh, to give their own perspectives for patient public involvement in the UK. So if anyone is interested, do watch out for that. So I'm going to ask some questions. Um, uh, some of these you have seen before, some you haven't. Um, but Christian, one of the things I just want to first pick up is um, this thing about you, the um, laparoscopy not being a gold standard. Um, one of the things we, I'm sure, discussed this before um, is that, you know, really good, knowledgeable doctors who are good at scanning with the right kit and know about endometriosis can pick up some types of endometriosis. But that's not everybody can pick up endometriosis, is it? So, so um, I suppose there's a point in there about there's this sort of, it's not like a suddenly, suddenly everyone can get scanned. It's something that we'll need to train people, et cetera. Do you want to say a little bit about that? No, I agree. And um, I think that's something that needs to be implemented. I mean, you know, you, you guys are um, um, running a campaign very rightly so to you know, update the NICE guidelines as well. And, you know, as we know, the NICE guidelines very much take into account, you know, availability and cost and all these type of things. But um, so, the problem is with with sometimes with the evidence that they come from endometriosis centers and the question is always how transferable is this into a real world setting um you know in oxford we get a lot of ultrasounds where you know yes they show there's a uterus there's some ovaries and um thanks for coming um so i, I would argue that probably everybody who does a bit of ultrasound can see whether there's an endometriosis system or not so i think ovarian endometriosis is fine the tricky bit comes when it uh, is, is when it comes to deep endometriosis. Um, and I think for that, you need really specialized care. But um, as we can do it, um, and it's doable, um, I think the government or, you know, whoever organizes this um, needs to ensure that uh, available, uh, the training is available. So it's widespread uh, that every endometriosis center should have at least one or maybe two people who can actually do this. Um, we. You know, but even in the in the um, in the centers, you know, UCH, you know, there's others around um, who are very good at this at scanning. Um, um, so peritoneal disease is still a problem. Yeah, yeah. So that that's that's great. So everyone, yeah, we're not going to suddenly get into a state where everyone's suddenly having scans that do it. It's definitely something we'll be campaigning for better training and access to the right kit and things like that. Thank you for that. Um, one question, um, maybe you could just briefly say, Christian, is, is a question around, uh, will the ESHRA guidelines influence decisions on endometriosis research? You mentioned there's a few recommendations in there. Does it have an impact? Well, you know, it remains to be seen, I guess. Um, you know, we've, we've put them out there and, you know, when we write grants or when we go to the funders and say, you know, um, can we have money for this and that, um, we, need to emphasize why this is important and therefore if you can go back to you know the document the issue guidelines or uh, before the uh, the Linden lines uh, James Linden lines that uh, was organized uh, by uh, by Edinburgh for example um, that's quite helpful because you know again here in, in the issue guidelines but also the Linden, uh, James Linden lines it was very strong uh, influence strongly influenced by patients and that's the most important thing I think yeah that's great. Um, there's been a couple of questions that I'm going to sort of merge into one, which is basically people saying, well, OK, the guidelines are out. Will that impact on how BSGE surgeons work or how, doc, you know, how doctors in practice change their practice? At what point do, 
people do that. Now, just before Christian answers that, um, I'm just going to flag before I forget. Um, we have a big campaign at the moment is we are pushing to get the endometriosis guidelines produced by NICE, National Institute of Clinical Health Excellence, updated. They um, were last done, well, they were the first ones ever were published in 2017. I always say they're a good first step, but they've got gaps in them. And now we have the ESHRA guidance. There's new evidence that's been gathered um, and there's some real gaps in the NICE ones. There's nothing around... Um, well, I don't think there's enough around non-drug non use pain management, so what they call non-pharmaceutical pain management around, there's nothing on mental health support, there's nothing on thoracic, and there's a whole bunch of other things Christian's touched on. So if you haven't already, I'd be really grateful if you could write to your MP to help them support our campaign. If you go to our website, it's on the front page there. And really this is where we have to kick in as a community and try and like make a noise and say, look, we want these taken on board. But Christian, from a practice perspective, you know, great guidelines are out what actually happens to how does that influence practice um well again it re remains to be seen i mean the the evidence is out there and the, you know we're, we're not you know the the guidelines are based on the available evidence and um there are many or there are a few bsge members as well that you know were in the in the in the guideline group um so i hope that it will be uh, a, adopted as well um I cannot make people do it. Um, you know, people in, in this country go very much by NICE, uh, which is fine, but um, NICE is now five years old and there's no evidence. So I think you should go with the best ev available evidence. Um, but as you're saying correctly, you know, let's do NICE again and um, there will be new evidence. And maybe it, the new guidelines, the NICE guidelines will be slightly different from what Ezra has come up with. And just um, so that everyone clear, the NICE guidelines are produced in England, and uh, but they have been adopted by all four nations in the UK as the standard for across the UK. So although technically they are produced for England, they they had uh, national input um, and that sort of thing. So as I say, that's our big campaign. Let's try and get that done. Yeah. The, um, um, so the the ESRA guidelines actually before NICE came on were um, the ones that uh, were um, the ones adopted here by the Royal College back then, um, and then NICE came and obviously took that over. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that one. Um, one specific question, and, and um, is, is somebody saying they've been diagnosed with endometriosis, but they don't know what stage they were just told they had endometriosis. Do they need to find out what stage, and how would they find out about that? Staging is a, is a big, big problem. Um, so you know, most people go with uh, the so-called ASRM stage, uh, which is a very old stage. Um, it's not really associated with the severity of um, the symptoms. Um, I think it's mostly for the doctors to get a rough idea of how much disease there is, um, but otherwise it's not very helpful. There, there's a, another um, staging system that's very surgical uh, called the ENSEAN um, uh, classification, but none of them are perfect. So um, I, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Um, if, the pay, uh, if the person wants to find out um, she could go to her, you know, gynecologist and, and um, you know, ask, I guess. But it does. I don't think it has a significant influence on many things. Yeah, and one of the things we know is that, irrespective of your the level of endometriosis or the stage you're at, doesn't impact on your symptoms. So you can be stage one and have very severe symptoms, and you can have stage four and not have severe symptoms. So that's the beauty of endometriosis; it's not consistent in how it how it works like that one. Mm. Um, so moving on, um, sorry, Helen, these seem to be mainly for Christian at this point, so I'm going to carry on. Thank you, Christian. Um, uh, so um, one of the questions someone's uh, just answered, um, just asked, sorry, is around ovarian cancer. So you, you mentioned about um, the increased risk of ovarian cancer and that it can be ovarian endometriomas, I should say, can be picked up by ultrasound. But can can cancer be ruled out before surgery? So do endometriomas have a different characteristic on scans than? Yeah, so endometrioma have a quite typical characteristic. Uh, we call them the ground glass appearance. Um, so it's, I guess, the, the, the blood that's in there, um, you know, makes it quite likely that there's an endometrioma. Um, the, um, the ultrasound gurus, they have come up with... Um, you know, classification or, or you know, how, how you look should look at ovarian cysts. And um, I think, um, you know, an experienced uh, sonographer or a radiologist can definitely differentiate between endometrioma and non-endometrioma. When it comes to cancer, there are 
certain criteria as well. If this was perfect, um, then obviously we wouldn't have um, the problem of ovarian cancer still. Um, but um, I think, you know, there's a pretty good um, way of, of identifying endometrioma from, uh, from other cysts. Um, the gynecologists oncologist will probably also um, take some, some blood tests. So this, you know, CA125, which we shouldn't use as a screening tool for endometriosis, uh, but they will look at that and see if this is very severely elevated, maybe then there's a slightly higher risk of, um, of malignancy. And then you should go with your local guidelines or with the national guidelines of how to deal with it. That's great. Thank you, Christian. Um, so we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm just trying to look at the questions. Um, now, you touched on in the guidelines, and one of the things that we're pushing for is for endometriosis outside the pelvic cavity to be recognised. And so um, uh, the BSG, British Society of Gynecological Endoscopy, and the RCOG, uh, Royal College for Obstetricians and Gynecologists, have recently issued a statement around uh, thoracic endometriosis, which is the more common of it outside uh, the pelvic cavity. And we don't know much about it, do we? It's believed that maybe up to 12% of those with endometriosis might have it outside um, of, uh, of, of the pelvic cavity. Um, but I suppose one of the, the questions is, where, is, is, if, is how does it get diagnosed at the moment? So if you had something that was around, around your chest or thoracic, how might that get diagnosed? Uh, well, it's, it's tricky. Um, you know, people do it with various things, um, with um, x-ray, usually as the first thing, although you rarely see anything there. Um, MRI is usually the way uh, forward uh, for that. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the endometriosis can also be on the diaphragm, so basically on the other side of the, of the um, uh, chest cavity, uh, causing similar symptoms. Um, the problem is these lesions are often extremely small and even with MRI, you, you miss them, like you miss peritoneal endometriosis as well. Um, you know, uh, most people then do empirical treatment and treat with hormones and see whether um, the symptoms get better and then that points again in this direction. Um, the question then is also what you do about it. Do you, you know, do relatively large, a big surgery for it or would you rather treat it with with hormones uh, again you need to discuss it with the patient the pros and cons yeah that's great um and um what are some of these we touched on or you touched on the facility preservation and um someone's asked a quite a specific one but i know it's your area of expertise christian so i'm going to ask you mm -hmm. is someone they're 23 um they want children is sooner better than later to try to have children um so my first answer is never have a doctor tell you when to have children <laughs> Um, very important. Um, so if you have endometriosis, um, you know, become pregnant or any person become pregnant when you, you feel it's right. Obviously, in, in general, you know, earlier is better than, than later, but whether you're 23 or 33 is not much of a difference. Um, if you are worried, um, then, you know, do a blood test, uh, an AMH blood test, anti-malarian hormone, AMH, which is probably the best or one of the two best indicators of the ovarian reserve, as in how many eggs are left in the ovaries. Um, the other one is when you have an ultrasound scan, uh, something called the antral follicle count, meaning the small, small growing follicles, um, which are also indicative of what the ovarian reserve is like. Um, but just being 23 and having endometriosis does not mean um, necessarily that, you know, it's time now to have children. Um, so... That's great. I know. I think we can just this one we can't answer, Christian. But I'm thinking we might need to take away. We've had a question which is around if someone's had breast cancer, but they've been recommended to go into medical menopause for endometriosis, then they can't have HRT. Now, I think I've seen a recent um, article come out around breast cancer and HRT. So the person who asked that, I don't know if we can answer that in two minutes now, but maybe that's something we could follow up with uh, Christian and, and other medical advisors help about what, you know, if someone has had breast cancer and they've got endometriosis, how does HRT? And actually you've got a magic answer in a minute and a half, Christian, on that one. And no, I don't. I, I think it needs to be a close uh, discussion with the oncologist and the um, the gynecologist. And that's yeah, um, and I, I did see. Um, I have to dig it out. And if we can find this, we'll put it on the link. But I do know there was um, there's been some recent research um, around 
uh, HRT and breast cancer. Again, it depend, it's very dependent on the type of breast cancer, et cetera. Yes, for, I know that from personal perspective, yes. so go for it on that one. Now, I am afraid that we have run out of time. We have still got questions we haven't answered, and we will try and look at how we can follow those up. Um, we've been looking very much at the guidelines today, not specifically about endometriosis, but the guidelines um, it's, it's some might think the 200 page documents a bit dry but it's actually having these guidelines that will give us the tools to actually campaign and leverage for change to improve care going forward so a very big thank you to christian and to helen for all their input into producing the guidelines they are a massive a massive undertaking um I, d I don't know if christian or helen you had anything you wanted to add um, before we say goodbye any any last thoughts at all no, not really. I completely agree with what you just said. It just uh, the guidelines will help, if not get a secure future funding. They'll give more weight to our to our course. So that I think they're brilliant. Okay. And I think um, you know I'm I'm very happy that we had a lot of patient input. Um, I think as, as a doctor, you sometimes forget. Um, and um, I think if you if you're guided by the by by patients, um, it's very helpful. Yeah, Thanks. sometimes it can be interesting, but not necessarily useful. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much to both again the speakers. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for coming along.